This morning I'd like to share with you a, a verse from Psalms and some imagery, the way that the psalmist describes this David that expresses a very interesting and precious relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father that we tend to distance ourselves from because we don't relate to Him at times. We don't understand it. But David writes in Psalms 56, verse 8, he says, You've kept my count, you have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? You know about my journeys. You know about my trials. You know about my sufferings. Take my tears and put them in your bottle. Are they not in your book? So there's a couple of fundamental things we see right away. We see this idea of him saying that God has kept count of them. He knows what I'm going through. He's aware of what's happened. And that there's some thing of kind of a figurative way of there's this bottle that God has your tears in. He says, Lord, take my tears and put them into this bottle of yours. Are not my sufferings recorded in your book? Two things that we look at that many times we fail to remember about our Heavenly Father. We think he's too busy. He's running this big universe. I mean, he's keeping gravity going. He's got the stars spinning around, you know. He's growing crops. He's doing all this stuff. And then there's you. And who are you? And here's David writing about this. David cried. David wept a lot, hot and bitterly at times when you read his Psalms. And this is a man that God described with all of his frail, frailties and, and some really bad things he did as a man that was after, God says, my heart. And I love the fact that we have such a person like him, not because we can make him a superhero, but because every aspect of this young man, as he comes up through history, as we learn about him, is us. And we have in him someone who was able to take his heart and pour it out into words that fits every emotion and event that we have all gone through. Oh, Solomon, yeah, his son, he wrote this really wise book, Ecclesiastes. But his father, oh, he was able to just take it and express it, and there's not one of those that doesn't fit us. We all cry. You know, we're, you know it's, it's rare for a person to not be able to cry. Sociopaths, I don't think they can physically cry. I mean, physically, yes, but they can't engage it. It's rare. You know, I, you, know you hear little phrases like, well, big boys don't cry. You know, and, you know, you get all this and you got this macho side where men, you know, young boys are raised up. And then, then they have some that just, you know, they're raised in a house that's not so macho. And then it's not the same way. But we're conditioned, aren't we? But you can't change the biological fact that, that it happens. There's times, you know, I, my father, I was raised that way, kind of very, you know, I guess masculine. Um, truck driver, you know, farmers and stuff, all my cousins. And, so, yeah, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't something my dad walked around and hugged us and, you know, I love you, son. And it, no. And when I did see my father cry, it shook me. Because there's only one time I remember seeing him cry. And it was when his dad died. And he just sat there. And I thought to myself, I thought, the, the, and look at the power of that moment. Think about when you see somebody cry. You cannot help but be connected a little bit with them, right? It's hard to sit there and go, huh, come on, man, what's going on with your eyes? You got a medical problem? Actually, this last week, I was riding with a friend of mine, bicycle a lot. He has a condition where no matter what the air hits him, it comes down, and he just starts watering. And it was interesting, because here I am working on this sermon about crying, and so I tease him, because he's a retired state cop. And so I told him, I go, Mike, you know why that's happening, right? Because you didn't cry enough. You were, you were a hard cop. So now all those tears are bottled up inside there. they got to come out now. 
And he just laughed. I'm, you know, I, I think about, I thought about it. I'm like, what do we do with that emotion? That emotion's there. You can't stop it. You might be able to kind of refrain it. But you know what I have found personally, there's times that, you know, because I've repressed it, there'll be something really interesting, that just, just something silly um, that, that is sensitive that will trigger it. And all of a sudden I know that, why am I getting weepy? I weep, by the way. I don't cry. I kind of get a little wet. But, you know, I'm, but, but I can't, I, it's all of a sudden out of nowhere, I'll, I'll see something like that happens to somebody, like a child. And then out of nowhere, all of a sudden I just feel this heaviness in my eyes. And I'm, and there's times when I'm preaching, you've seen me, you know, I sit there and <clears throat> I have to think about my dad crying just now. I was sitting there kind of sucking it up, you know, it's like, but I'll tell you what, when I have allowed myself to let it out, what a cleansing feeling, right? That's an amazing sensation that you feel when you're, you're able to let it out. So I've learned to respect people who can cry, that will cry, because there's a part where I can, I know the few times that I have the, the power of that emotion. But where does it come from? Some people can cry like that. You watch actors, you always wonder, how do they do that? You know, they, they shoot that scene 50 times, right? where their lover or friend is going off into nowhere, you know, and they're, they, they, they cry, you know, they're sitting there. How do they do that? Well, they got different ways of doing it. But some of those actors, they actually can do it. But what do they do? They think of something. They have a trigger or something that they can connect to that can trigger a physical response. But you and I, it's life, isn't it? It's life. Life just happens around us. And just as it's happening, good and bad, the good that we have, those moments come forward, don't they? We've all had them, and we have them. Maybe you're going through them now. There's a lot of people that are suffering through different physical, financial, emotional things that are happening, family. Oh, man, tell me an aspect that, there's, that you have in your life that you can say, I don't have to worry about that. No, because Why? So it's something that we've, God created with us, and that's one of the things about emotions. We always have to remember that God created them with us, not to make us weak, to make us you know, like, look like we're vulnerable, but to complete us, right? Complete us. So all of those emotions that you have and that we have, you know, when I have one that gets out of control, I sit there and go, why did you give me anger? Why, why can't I just get, why did you have to put anger in a human? I mean, just think of the kindness we could have. Why do you have to make me cry? Why do you have to put that inside me? And it's hard. We can't, we can't figure out, but we know that our Father cares about us. And there's an aspect here this morning that I want us to remember. We are created in the image of our Father. And all of us look different in this room, so we know it's not physical. We know that it's a spiritual likeness. So when we think about some aspects of our lives and those emotions, we need to go back and remember that we are created in the image of His Spirit. And that's why I want you to do this morning. When we look at David, he was kind of thrust on the scene. I mean, here he is. He's a little boy out there in the pasture, just minding his own business. Back at home, there's this prophet comes to town named Samuel, and God has directed him to his house. And while he's out there with the sheep and everything, his brothers are being paraded before this, this prophet. And the prophet keeps going, no, that's not him. No, that's not him. God, God's got Samuel on a mission to find a new king and anoint him. He's probably around 17, 18 years of age. And he's the least valued of the brothers. So guess, where, guess what little brothers always get to do? The youngest gets to do what? Everything that the other siblings want. So he's out there watching the flock. And everyone of them has prayed it before. And Father is probably going, oh, you're looking for a... Look at Bob here. Look at this boy. He's a fine specimen. Look at this, you know. And God's saying, no, 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 no. And they're out of brothers. And finally, Samuel's like, oh, wait a minute. Is there another one? I mean, and he goes, well, you know, now that you mention it, um, hey, go fetch David. David? Uh, okay. So here he comes. 
And we know a lot about him now, and so you, can, you know that there was a part that he had, he had started like, to adapt into that, that environment. David was a man, outside guy. I mean, he was adapted. This is the guy that he says later on that he fought and killed a lion while he was a shepherd. So when was he a shepherd? He was a young boy. Killed a lion and a bear. And here he comes in, and he's the one, and he becomes anointed as the king of Israel. And then it's like all of a sudden the narrative goes, that, oh, well, get on back there, boy. Get out there to the sheep. And we seem to like, what happened? And there's a few confusing things as you go through 1 Samuel 15 in there. You know, it's like, well, he goes out to sheep. And then we have this story. We have this story that you're all familiar with. Well, guess what? Saul is out there fighting against the Philistines. And they got a standoff because nobody really wants to go against the one guy, the champion of the Philistines. Guess who? Goliath. David wants to be with his brother so bad. He wants to be accepted. And so what does he do? He's like, Dad, let me take the supplies up and go kind of give, take supplies to our brothers who's up there being soldiers because I'm too little and you won't let me fight. All right. So David goes. And while he's up there, he sees the champion walking down and he's mocking the God of Israel. And David's spirit is stirred and he looks over at everyone. He goes, why isn't somebody doing anything about this? And well, well, you know, he's like seven foot. He's carrying a 200-pound shield. I mean, come. and this little boy. And they try to put the king's armor on him. Remember that? You can just see this little kid, you know, like, no. Gets out there with three stones. Boom. And there we got David. We got this young boy. But then again, it goes back to this storyline. You think, well, wait, what, what's going on here, God? Because you have a king, Saul. You've already said you rejected him. And then you sent Samuel to go find a king. You anointed him. And then you just put him on the bench. Wouldn't you feel that way? I mean, if you, if you were especially a teenager and some prophet came along and he anointed you and said, you're the king of Israel, you're the anointed by God. You'd say, well, okay, <clears throat> where's my throne? Let's go, Samuel. I want to sit on the throne now. Doesn't happen like that, does it, for this poor kid? Well, he gets accepted, kind of gets an apprenticeship, gets to go up to the palace there with Saul. But everybody, and so Saul's like, yeah, okay. Starts out okay kind of relationship. And we know that eventually uh, he becomes a pain because there's this jealousy starts to build up. One, because Samuel has told him, God is no longer with you. Now, we don't know if Saul ever was told that Samuel had gone off and anointed this kid. We don't really know. But it doesn't matter because his spirit became very evil against him. And so we find his, everything he's doing, like Joseph in Egypt, was just successful. The kid could fight. So just imagine, he's in his tw like 20 years old. And he has been put in charge of the army of Israel for the king. And he is working it over, man. He's like taking out the enemies. And he tricks him. Because now, not only is he popular, but they wrote a song about him. <laughs> they wrote a song and all the women are singing about him. And King Saul has killed his thousand, but David has killed tens of thousands. And the women are loving it. And he's like... So jealousy builds up. And he just finally <laughs> saw just like, I I'm going to kill him. So one time while he's performing, because he was a musician, Saul takes his spear, whoom, throws it at him across the room. Boom! Can you imagine that? Brrr, on the wall, and you're standing there going. So it's, it's time to go. <laughs> How confusing would that be for you? Here you are. You're the anointed. You're supposed to be the king. He's a king. Don't you think we should get along? I'm probably the youngster that's going to take over. Shouldn't you be mentoring me? And you're trying to kill me. And from then on, for nearly 15 years, he's on the run. Literally, he's a fugitive. He's got the entire army of Israel tracking him down. He can't turn anywhere. And while he's out there, we see that when the people are being molested and robbed and attacked by the Philistines and coming into the border, King Saul, what's he doing about it? Nothing. 
David should have kept low. You know, when you rob a train, you don't come back out and be the good guy because then everybody knows where you're at. David, because of who he was, he would come out and he would take the men that he had, the mighty men, a warrior, and he would go and he would attack the Philistines and protect the people. When Saul was up there, the only thing Saul ever got out of that was the fact that now he knew where David was. And then he would go and hunt him down like a dog. And then there's a point where the Philistine king, he flees in the Philistia and tries to get away, and the king of Gad captures him. Then he acts like a ridiculous madman, remember that? And he has to flee away. That's when this psalm is wrote. Now the superscript above each of these psalms, you'll read, will have something about who, who wrote it, if it's a, music, a musical piece, how to set the tune to it, and this one is written, and superscript is talking about the time period. Now, we have no idea. This was not an inspired superscript. We don't know when those were placed in there, but they have a pretty good idea. A lot of the old rabbis that were putting together the Septuagint and older manuscripts have placed those in there just so that I... So, but this one says that it's during this time when he was being pursued by Saul and had been captured by the king of Gath the Philistines, and when he had to act mad, and he escapes to the cave of Adullah and had to live in this cave. You notice also, remember, there's another part where he had opportunities to kill Saul, and he wouldn't do it. And his own people are provoking him. Are you crazy? Kill him now, and you're king. Think about that. Think about that for a moment. It's dark. He's in there going to the bathroom, and you can go up close enough to where you can clip off a corner of his cloak. You talk about a Navy SEAL, stealth. David could do that, but he wouldn't kill him. He wouldn't kill him. You know what he said? He is God's anointed. And I bet his men probably looked back and said, you are too, though, and you know that man's evil. Go kill him. But he allowed himself to be in that condition because he knew it wasn't what God wanted. And that's a part of his spirit. And that was a part of his anguish that he went through. And it didn't stop there. I mean, finally, when Saul's killed and he becomes king, it doesn't stop there. You think, whew, okay, we finally reconciled. We got it all together. Well, I should start getting a little easier now. Mm Mm-mm. No, it gets worse. You talk about a combat soldier with post-traumatic stress. David had it. He would have been diagnosed with it. He had not only those type of emotional things, but yet at the same time, he could kind of separate distance from those. But there were times that he was completely human. One point where he should have been out and been leading his soldiers during the spring and in combat. No, he's lounging around. And he looks out across his house and he sees a woman bathing. And he lets his desires overtake him. She is married. And so he has a lustful relationship with her, and she becomes pregnant. Now it's cover-up time. So he hides his sin. Instead of confessing it and offering a sacrifice and making it right, he buries it. He buries it. And now she comes and goes, guess what? Honey, I'm pregnant. Well, guess where her husband is? Her husband hasn't been home in over six months, so it's going to be a little obvious he is one of the mighty men of warrior that was with David in the wilderness, that was in the cave of Adullam, that suffered right along with him, Uriah, one of his best men. And he took her as... And then, so he comes up with this plan and he says, hey, you know what? Bring Uriah back. We'll kind of set this up. We've got to do it quick because, you know, it's going to be a little obvious that she's pregnant. And so he tries to bring him back and then have him you know, go home and have that husband-wife relationship to where then if she, if she did or didn't get pregnant, they could say, well, see there, okay, that's Uriah's child. This man was so righteous that he wouldn't go home. He slept on the floor. Huh. Plan B. Next night, get him drunk. You know, get drunk, you're going to want to go see your wife. And you know what he said? I will not do that, Uriah said. Because my men and God's soldiers are out there fighting, and they are not able to do this, so I'm not. 
So David's like, okay, plan C. He writes a letter to Joab, the commander, and he says, I want you to place him in the most contested place of battle, and then I want you to give a command to pull back and leave him exposed so that he'll die. He writes this letter, seals it, and puts it in the post office. No. You know who carries it back? Uriah carries his own death letter back. Can you imagine? Just look, this is the same David. The same man that God said, he's after my heart, has gotten so cold and crushed down sin to where it's so buried in him that he has the coldness of heart to write a letter to have a man murder because of your sin and then have him deliver it. Can you imagine Joab standing there looking at Uriah? So how was your trip, Uriah? Pretty good, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And looking at Uriah. Now, Joab's another case, isn't it? He wasn't that. I mean, so this man nearly kills himself emotionally. David burying his sins. And it took a prophet of God to come to him. And it broke loose that flood of emotions of them. And then his child that was born by her dies. And we see him prostrate himself. And he realizes the consequences of all that he's done, the death of this beautiful, holy man, Uriah. He's defiled this woman, Bathsheba. He's now caused the death of his own child. And it gets worse. He's got a son called Absalom, who's a little arrogant, gorgeous, king material, kind of like Saul was. But he, David ignores his children. David is a terrible father. He really is. But Absalom rises up, and he gets it in his head, I would be better. But it triggers because there's something in between. But anyway, he rises up against his own father. To the point where David literally had to pack up and evacuate Jerusalem by night. Absalom was coming to kill his dad. And he flees. Now David is good on the run. That's one thing. He's a, he's a Navy SEAL of Jerusalem. This guy knows how to fight out there. And so he takes off. And what's interesting is whenever Absalom decides we're going to pursue him, he gets advice and says, Duh, you might not want to do that. Your dad's pretty good out there. <laughs> if we could have kept him in the house here, we could have probably taken him. But now that he's out there, but he wouldn't listen. So Absalom pursues him. David ends up destroying the army. But that Joab catches his son hanging by his hair, got trapped, and he goes up and stabs him and kills him. And after the victory, you would think that he'd be all excited about, okay, we crushed the rebellion. You know what he's asking about? Not about, you know, how well or did we do it. You know what he's asking about? His son. He's asking about his son who caused the death of all of that. The whole thing. And he says, but what about Absalom? And they said, "Mm, no, Joab killed him. And Joab comes up and goes, yeah, I did. You're going to keep that kid around? Are you kidding me? And, And you can see there's a psalm written about that. He knows again, it's my fault as a parent. I have done this. I ignored him and I set the thing into motion. His life set so many things in the wrong direction that he spent a lot of time trying to do catch up. And in the psalms, is where you see it poured out. And this is one. And so as we go through and we look at this and we see the way that he goes through, this is why we understand Psalms 56.1. I'm getting back to that verse 8. But look what he starts out. These are the first six verses. He says, Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long. An attacker opposes me. My enemies trample me all day long. For many attack me proudly. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, God, whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. 
They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. Does that sound like a time in your life where everybody seems to be against you, that they're looking or plotting or, you know, and sometimes, it, okay, I'm not talking about that, you know, paranoid time, but there's a lot of ways we have been in this very point. But he keeps coming back. You notice that? He keeps coming back. That's one thing beautiful about him. He can pour out his anger. One time he says, smash the teeth of my enemy. And you're like, wow. And then there's times where he says, I am crushed in my spirit. I don't know where to go. But he always comes back and he acknowledges God. Those emotions, you know what they do? They bring him back to God. No matter what his failures are, they will take and start leading him away. When he will let his heart feel what God has intended to feel within us, brings his spirit back to God. He said, I will trust in your word. I know that it's your word. There was another king much later on named Hezekiah. That he found himself, and he was a good king of maybe two out of 20 something kings that was good. But he got sick and he was very ill. And, he, and the prophet Isaiah, you remember that guy wrote the book, Isaiah, comes to him and says, Get your house in order, you're going to die. How would you like that? A prophet of God show up and say, it's over. And it's like, I have so much work. He's a good king. You would even ask. You, I think all of us would question and go, man, I know what came before him, and I know what's coming after him. Why? You know, why would you take him? And, ah, man, Hezekiah pours out his heart. So when he comes to that point of death, and then we see, he says, set that in order. You're not going to recover. Before Isaiah, Isaiah even gets out to the outer court, look what happens. Before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came back to him and said, turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Of all the things God sees, there's so many things. I mean, just look at the nebulas out there in space. Just look at the ocean and the power that's going on around. Just look at the beautiful animals that are going on. And just, you just, just, just think of life everywhere that you could look at. And God saw Hezekiah's tears. So what about your tears? How important are they to God? Have you ever thought of that? It's, a, it's an amazing relationship we have with him that many times we forget about how beautiful our father is. How wonderful we have. Not this God that's so busy running the universe that he's so busy, it's like, oh, uh, hand him some Kleenex. I mean, he knows the end of it. So what's he worried about? God already knows, you know, I mean, it's like we have this path, we're traveling along. But yet he'll stop and look and see your tears. And as David said, puts them in a bottle and has them written in a book. So, I want us to know, and I want you to be confident. He knows, he hears, but most of all, he understands. See, there's a lot of times, like, you know, <laughs> when Suzanne and I are talking, she'll go, were you listening? Did you hear me? And I go, yeah, but I wasn't listening. <laughs> There's a difference, isn't there? Yeah, I heard noise. I heard blah, 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 like Charlie Brown. And it's like, but I, what, what, what did you say? You know, that, that's kind of like sometimes I think with, we, do we do this to God sometimes? It's almost like, yeah, I know he saw me cry. I'm out in the open and he's everywhere. But did you realize? He cares. That's beautiful. That brings out this relationship that we have that is so precious, isn't it? And as the psalmist said, he's like a father. He describes it in Psalms 103. He says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. 
For He knows our frame, our body. He remembers that we're dust. Even though we have within us this eternal spirit, He remembers the fact that we are frail, that we are subject to the environment in which we live, and He has compassion. He, like I said, He could just say, you know what, dude, you're going to only live 70 years, and then you're going to have a bajillion years in eternity, or whatever eternity is. So just suck it up for 70 years. Come on. See the difference? I mean, that's, I'm sorry, but I think that's what I would be saying. I'd say, guys, come on, get tissue box, get over it. This life is very short, and then you're going to be in a beautiful place. But he knows what we're made of. And so he has that compassion to still have that sympathy. And that's hard for us to pull together, isn't it? He has sorrow. He has those emotions. Remember, we're created in spirit. You know, we see in Genesis 6, 6, right after he had created, I mean, early in our history, he regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And we know God doesn't have physical tears. But you don't have to pour out physical tears to have a lot of these emotions. But you can see that God himself, they're not just words being put so that you, us humans, can understand it. They're legitimate. It broke his heart. He had sorrow. We see that he has joy. The prophet Zephaniah, in talking about this restoration, this reconciliation with God and his people, this beautiful moment, you know what? God's going to be happy. Look what he said. And the Lord your God is in your midst, mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. That's true joy. You know, when we hear that verse, it says, you know, we don't know where the verse is a lot of times, but we'll hear this one verse. It says, and the angels rejoiced. The angels rejoice. Everything that God has created has that sensitivity about it that wants to be. Because why? It completes us. It makes us more God-like to have those emotions. And when we see that they're real, they're in our Father, we see some bad ones, too, that we don't like. We see that he has anger, don't we? As in Psalms 80, verse 4, he says, O oh God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? So the interactions that we have with him cause those emotions, just like you if you're a parent, just like you as a parent. The things that we do create emotions, emotional reactions to what we do. And we need to be sensitive to them. We need to be able to look at those and take time. You know, instead of like when I was little and fell out of a tree, say, come on, man, rub it off. Dad, but it's bleeding. We'll get a washcloth. Mm -mm. And then we wonder why the next generation is harder. Instead of, you know, well, come here, son, come here. And hugging. Let's fix that. Let's take care of it. See, that... That is our God. That's our Father. He wants to fix it. He wants to hug. He wants to show you, I know what your body's like. I know what you are fighting. He is very aware of what's going on. Look what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 20, chapter 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. We remember that. We love that one. But it's truthful that we don't seem to value how much he values us and how much that he is aware of everything as small as a tear drop off our cheek. That if the father knows that a sparrow falls, and that's one of the least valuable birds there is, in other words, that even the least valuable bird, when it falls, our Father knows. Do you not think you're more valuable? Yes, you are. You're far more valuable. And that brings into this great, even greater aspect of the idea of Christ coming. So we have this Father that the prophets were hearing about His emotions, and He was showing them through His actions, but nobody had seen Him. That, that's what the Hebrew writer says, right? Nobody had seen him. John says that as well. Nobody had seen the Father until what? That's right. 
the sun came. And what did we see? He's got blonde hair, blue, no. What did we see? We saw the character of the father dealing with the frailty of a fleshly body. So yes, he created us and the psalmist could cry out, yeah, he knows what my frame's like because he built it, but then when the sun came, he lived in it. He knew what a headache was like. When he stumped his toe, it hurt. When he had a headache, it hurt. When he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights without eating, he starved. So when people try to minimize the God part of Jesus, I get angry. Because that's what he wanted us to know. Is it I came down and I wanted you to understand what it's like because I got angry. I got sad. I experienced the pain and the suffering of loss. And so that's why the Hebrew writer says, For do we not have a high priest? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You know, he's the other Adam. That's what Paul says. The, the, the first Adam, he could do the same. He could understand, but you know what? He did sin. This Adam brought victory. Not to shame you. Not to shame us at all. But to defeat it. And so we see this type of thing where he says he is completely able to understand he was tempted in every way. Now think of all the ways that a person can be tempted or that you have been tempted and you have fallen. And he has. If it has to do with intoxication, I mean, there was alcohol, right? There was alcohol. He went to, he went to places where there was alcohol. He saw what it was like. His body would sit there and go, wow, well, you know. He got that sensations of the, the adrenaline, the emotions that we get. His, his, his hormones that he had in his body when he went through puberty. <laughs> when he looked at a woman, guys, he had the same response that we have. So he understands when you say, I can't help it. I keep looking. I, I, I see things. I do this. He goes, I know. I know. <laughs> it was hard. But I can do it. And I'm giving you my life in order to overcome it as well. We see the physical, emotional response physically when he comes out. The Spirit of God is in there. Now, now remember, this is the, the Son who created everything, that took molecules and made molecules, that then the molecules then made things. Okay, that's this one. This is the Son. Nothing came into existence. It did not come through without him doing it. Now, here he is, the one who created the molecules, that created the molecules that made something in the body that he made. <laughs> and he has seen it all. He saw Noah. He saw Sodom and Gomorrah. He saw the struggles of Abraham. He was there with David, watching what he had to go through. He saw it all. He experienced it all. Jerusalem was a very precious place. God had Abraham's you know, sacrifice his son and stop him on that same mount. That mount Zion was prophetically powerful to God, very precious. If there's one spot on this earth to God during those days, it was Zion. And it was to be this city on the hill that Ronald Reagan talked about, you know, where all the world could look at and say, we want to know about your God. But what did the people do? He constantly corrupted that city. And so as Jesus approaches the city, he has an emotional human response. He wept when he saw that city. As he came up on Pentecost and he saw that the money changers there, that the circus had come to town, and they were there to juggle and sell and profit and do all these things, and he realized that they have no clue, no clue what they're doing that they're destroying the very thing that my father has pulled together 
to deliver to them. And the ultimate of it, as he approached it, he could see that cruel Golgotha. Knowing that it was going to end up there. It broke his heart to watch such a holy place that he threw out the money changers. He became angry, right? Another one that you're very familiar with that he's trying to show people, he's trying to teach people that he is God in the flesh and God cares and that there's more than this physical life. That if you die, it's okay. You're going to die. But I am the resurrection, he said. I am the one that's going to bring things to life. He had raised people he had done things. He walked on water. He fed the 5,000. He had given sight back. He had defeated all the physical uh, things there were. And the very people that were his own disciples couldn't grasp it. And so if you'll recall, while they're traveling, they come to him and they say, his disciples say, Lord, Lazarus is sick. He goes, I know. And then three days later, they say, Lord, Lazarus, he goes, I know, he's sleeping. No, he's dead. No, the Lord says, no, he's sleeping. You see, the Lord doesn't look at it that way. Here's God saying, it's asleep. And he did it on purpose. And then he comes to town, and what does he barrage with? Grieving family. Grieving family who knew, should have known. And then what does he say to them? He says, did I, do you not believe that I am the resurrection? Well, of course I do. I do, I do. But why didn't you get here before he had to? Why do we have to wait for a resurrection if you would have just been here? And the shortest verse in the Bible is what? Jesus wept. And you see, now you're fixing to bring him out of the grave. You know he's going to be alive, and they're going to be happy, right? So just bear with the crowd, you know. Okay, I'm going to get over to the tombs. You know, no, this shows how human he was. He wasn't grieving for Lazarus. He knew it was going to happen. You know what he's grieving about? It was the broken hearts of these people and the way they mourn. And the fact that they could not put their trust completely in this thought that he was the resurrection. How about you? We go to funerals all the time and we say that. We go, we weep, right? We weep. But we, and we put ourselves in check. We go, well, but we know. You know, they were a Christian. They were... You know, and that they're going to be raised in the last day. But we weep, and it's okay. So he wasn't weeping because they were just sad about him being dead. You know, what he was weeping about was the fact that they did not fully trust him to be the resurrection. And that is a sad condition, and he does not want you to be there. He wants you to have that confidence. And so he wept. And even as they, they misunderstand it, you know, some of those the professional weepers that were there, they look at him and go, wow, look how much he cared for him. He's weeping too. They didn't get it. And even as he approaches it, we see there in verse 38, he was deeply moved. Does this sound like a God who doesn't sympathize with everything? Everything? And going back to the Hebrew writer, what he says is it helps to explain that to us again in Hebrews 5, 7. Listen to what he says. And in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. You know, when he was in that garden in Gethsemane, he knew what was going to happen. And he is eternal. He is God. Of all the people who should not be weeping, should understand, okay, yeah, they're going to come, they're going to beat me, I'm going to bleed a lot, and they're going to hang me on a cross, and it's going to hurt, and then they're going to stick this spear inside me, and then I'm going to die, but guess what? <laughs> I win because I'm going to be back home. It would be him. It would be him. But that's not what we read about, is it? It's not. It's about a man who after he has the Lord's Supper and tries to teach him the importance of this communion and he goes to a garden to do what? To pray. To pray! He's God himself. But you know what he wants to do? He wants to be with the Father. But he knows he has to go through this and that frail body, that frame is going to cause such pain and suffering that even his spirit is grieved 
And he goes away and he falls down and he prays. You've heard that phrase of blood drops falling? Did you know that's a real medical condition? It's very rare, but it's been documented where somebody can have such an intensity that they actually will weep blood through their sweat glands. That's what was going on with Jesus. He was that intent of anticipation, of knowing what's going on, and praying to God that as His intensity, you can just imagine His spirit inside that body. He was probably ready to just, just break down. And his body is so intense that he's pushing blood. Blood is coming out in like sweat. And he comes back and guess what? They, what are they doing? They're sleeping. He knows, doesn't he? But as the Hebrew writer also said, there's a part of that cross that as he looked at that cross, he saw that cross in front of him. What? As joyful. Wait a minute. And why was he so upset in the garden? I'll tell you why. Why was he joyful? Because of you. That's right. Because of you and your tears. That's why he was joyful. Because he knew that by going through and hanging on the cross and allowing the sinfulness to brutalize him, that he coming out of that grave was going to be so victorious that he was going to be able to bring us with him in that resurrection. That's why Paul said in Corinthians, he goes, if there is no resurrection, we are fools. We are pitiful. And that's what he's trying to show. And that's why he looked at it, because he could bring us back to the Father, something that sin had removed us from, and he was going to bring it to us. I don't know if you noticed, but the songs that Dale led this morning, all of them had tears. Something about tears. Our tears will not leave. We're going to cry again and again and again. Sometimes we're going to weep bitterly. And as long as we're in this world, it's going to rage against us. And it's going to provoke those in us. But look what it did for David. It brought him back to who? It helped to settle him and cleanse him and remind him of who his heavenly father was and the power of his word and the power of putting his trust in him completely. And there's no greater image than this one that in the final book of the Bible, the way that God is trying to encourage those first century Christians is this verse right here. He says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Is this your destination? I know it's one where you want to go. You know, it's kind of like me. I would love to go on a cruise ship to Hawaii. But I, it ain't going to happen. I don't think. <laughs> one, Suzanne doesn't like cruise ships. and just, it, There's just some things that I can say I have a destination, but it, it's not, it's not going to happen. I'll probably never get to travel to Africa. I'd love to pick that as the destination, but it can't happen. I don't have the financial beans. I just don't have the time. There's many things. But you know what I do have? is heaven. This place that God revealed that there is a place where there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. Because the old is going to be put away. And we can have that confidence and understanding that you know what? God has bottled your tears. He knows every drop that comes from us, every part of our body and our existence, our Father cares. And He's trying to share it with you. And this morning, I want you to think about this. I want you to really get personal with yourself and the way you've been living before God. Are you a David? who has pushed down sin and repressed it so hard that it's really causing you to have a miserable life where you can't sleep, where things are just tearing you up? Are you having those things like that? And your tears being wasted because the world, they don't catch your tears. The world will let them fall every time onto dust and dry out. But not our Heavenly Father. 
Are you one that has allowed the Father to have your tears and yet there's now you've walked away? It's never too late. That's the beauty of it. Even David, you know, going back to David, when Nathaniel stood before him, the prophet, and he was going to bring out the idea that he had committed adultery and murdered a very righteous man, when, right when he was getting ready, you can read it for yourself, right when God was fixing to strike David dead, David broke. He broke. And you can tell that he was fi- God was fixing to kill him because the prophet looks at him and says, you know what, because you've changed, I, you're not, you're not going to die. I mean, up to the moment that God was going to bring forward a judgment on him, but David, and he describes it beautifully in a psalm about how he just had to let it crush him down and then pour it out. That's what we have to do. It's humiliating, but it's powerful. It's beautiful. So think about these things, and if we can help you in your relationship at all, let us know while we stand and sing. Have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know? Yeah.